Feeling anxious is a normal human emotion in some situations, like before an exam or a job interview, and is defined as a state of apprehension, uncertainty and uneasiness in anticipation of a real or perceived threat. But when these emotions become excessive, persistent and impact the person's ability to function, the term anxiety disorder is used. In fact, anxiety disorder is a term that describes a group of specific mental disorders characterised by this significant and uncontrollable anxiety that together affect up to one in three adults at some point in their lives. Although considered disorders in their own right, there are common symptoms between the anxiety disorders. People can feel panic, feelings of doom and restlessness, for example. Fear is defined as an emotional response to an immediate threat and tends to trigger the fight or flight response. While anxiety can also do so, it instead tends to cause avoidance behaviour and muscle tension. In some cases, anxiety can come on in sudden bursts, leading to overwhelming distress within minutes, known as panic attacks. Common, but not exclusive to panic attacks, are physical manifestations like tachycardia or palpitations, a sensation of choking or being unable to breathe, sweating, trembling, and even abdominal pain. Anxiety can be present chronically and can manifest as feeling on edge, easily fatigued, irritable, with difficulty concentrating, and difficulty in controlling worries. The different disorders can feature slightly different symptoms, but largely their differences are in the triggers. In general, according to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual 5th edition, for an anxiety disorder diagnosis, the symptoms need to have been present for 6 months, be out of proportion to the perceived threat, and cannot be the direct result of another medical or psychiatric condition, or the result of substances or medication. They should also have an impact on the person's ability to function in different scenarios, like socially or in work. Generalised anxiety disorder is the most common of these in older adults, defined by the DSM-5 as excessive anxiety or worry about multiple different things on most days for more than six months, with at least three of restlessness, fatigability, reduced concentration, irritability, muscle tension and poor sleep, combined with an inability to manage worry and an impairment in daily functioning. It is estimated that around 9% of adults will develop generalised anxiety disorder at some point in their lives. There tends to be no specific cause or trigger, for example work, health of family members, attending appointments, or doing tasks around the house. Specific phobias are the largest of the anxiety disorders, with around 10% of the population thought to be affected. They are characterised by having fear or anxiety when exposed to a specific object or situation, or even anticipating this exposure. The reaction is also persistent, some of the most common ones being a fear of heights, spiders, snakes and flying. You would expect social phobia or agoraphobia to be here, but they are considered their own disorders. While these emotions are normal in some situations, people with true phobias will go out of their way to avoid exposure and are often aware that their fear is excessive. Next is panic disorder, a form of anxiety where people experience recurrent panic attacks. The triggers can occur in specific scenarios, including irrational thoughts, but can also occur without warning. According to the DSM-5, these panic attacks must be recurrent and happening for over a period of one month to diagnose panic disorder, because one in three people will experience panic attacks, but only 10% of these will develop panic disorder. There must also be an impact beyond the attacks themselves, such as worrying about additional attacks or their implications, leading to a change in behaviour to try to avoid the attacks. 
Four of the following symptoms need to be present alongside a sudden surge of fear or physical discomfort. Panic attacks are most likely to develop in the mid-twenties and occur earlier in males than in females, but overall are more common in females and will generally become less common with increasing age. Now we have agoraphobia and social phobia, which has recently been renamed social anxiety disorder. Agoraphobia is a well-known anxiety disorder characterized by anxiety when the person is in situations or places that they perceive to be unsafe and from which they feel there is no escape. Open spaces is the classic example, but can also actually be closed spaces, crowds, public transport, and even being outside their own home. It usually is associated with panic disorder, with only some cases being agoraphobia without panic disorder. There's also a strong co-occurrence of social anxiety disorder, as people will become apprehensive of having a panic attack in a social situation. Social anxiety disorder is where people experience fear or anxiety in social or performance situations where they are exposed to potential scrutiny. They fear that they will be humiliated, rejected or embarrassed and exposure to the scenario will almost always trigger this response, leading the person to avoid these situations to the extent that it has an impact on daily functioning. The classic example being public speaking. It is amongst the most debilitating of the anxiety disorders and typically develops during late childhood or adolescence, often with a specific humiliating event being associated with its onset. Post-traumatic stress disorder is also an anxiety disorder, which I have a video dedicated to, but in summary, it's the result of trauma, commonly sexual assault or war, but can also be due to the threat of harm or even natural disasters. It can also come from indirect trauma, such as police or healthcare workers exposed to distressing histories. In addition to typical anxiety symptoms on exposure to reminders, there can be additional symptoms like recurrent thoughts related to the trauma, distressing nightmares and dissociative reactions like flashbacks. Hypervigilance is common where people constantly assess their surroundings for potential threats and are more reactive to these potential threats. Separation anxiety is excessive anxiety when there is separation from the home environment or a person where there is a strong attachment. The typical example being young children from parents. A degree of this is natural, but to count as a disorder, the distress caused is excessive and doesn't correspond with the expected level of development. For example, this could be clinging to parents at school and crying to the extent expected in severe pain. Separation anxiety disorder is most typically diagnosed in ages above three years. It needs to last four weeks in children, however, it is not exclusive to children. It can persist into adulthood, where it needs at least six months to confirm a diagnosis. It can manifest as refusing to sleep away from the person or having continuous worries of losing them. Obsessive compulsive disorder is often used to describe people with meticulous cleaning habits, but true cases are when people suffer unwanted and disturbing intrusive thoughts generating distress, which are called obsessions. Combined with compulsions, which are repetitive behaviours that help relieve these obsessive thoughts and the associated emotional distress. These behaviours vary and could be pacing, turning switches on and off, or even counting and muttering words. They are sometimes done in an attempt to prevent a perceived dreaded event. For a diagnosis, these obsessions and compulsions need to make up more than one hour per day or cause significant functional impairment. In selective mutism, the person has the ability to speak, but in certain situations becomes anxious to the point of being unable to speak. This can sometimes be perceived as shyness and is most commonly diagnosed in older children when it becomes apparent that they are talkative at home 
but will not speak in school. It can also persist into adulthood, and in most cases, there is a concurrent social anxiety disorder. A progressive form exists, called progressive mutism, where over time, the person will cease to speak in all situations, including to close family. Generally, a combination of genetics and environmental influences lead to anxiety disorders. For example, people with first-degree relatives are more likely to develop the disorders than those with no affected relatives. And some twin studies have shown that even if twins grow up in separated environments, if one is found to have an anxiety disorder, then there is still an elevated risk in the other. However, hereditary factors are thought to make up around 30% of the development, while environmental factors seem to play a larger role. These can include childhood adversities like parental alcoholism, divorce and bullying, a past trauma of varying kinds ranging from sexual abuse to a car accident, and socio-demographic factors like being unemployed or from a low socio-economic background. Females also tend to be more affected than males, estimated to be nearly twice as commonly. The exact reason is unknown, but some hypotheses have included the effect of pregnancy, which may come from an evolutionary drive to protect the unborn offspring, the fact that females are more likely to be victims of abuse, especially at an early age, and also that females are more likely to seek help for anxiety features and therefore get a diagnosis. In most cases, treatment is a combination of psychotherapy, primarily cognitive behavioural therapy, and medication. CBT is recommended in nearly each disorder, and can be done face-to-face, or more recently, through digital sources, and can include exposure therapy, where people are exposed to their fears or triggers in a safe environment. Psychoeducation is also important, as it helps the person to understand anxiety. Relaxation techniques are also useful, as are using self-help resources, sleep hygiene, and exercise. Medications generally start with selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, like paroxetine, sertraline, fluoxetine, or escitalopram, although there is limited evidence on which one is most effective. Serotonin noradrenaline reuptake inhibitors including venlafaxine or duloxetine, are other options. Other agents like busperone, a serotonin receptor agonist, and pregabalin can be considered if the first-line agents are not effective. Tricyclic antidepressants are used in some cases, like clomipramine in obsessive-compulsive disorder. However, due to them typically being less tolerated due to side effects, they are not used as the first choice. Benzodiazepines are used in acute stressful states, but are not recommended for long-term use due to their addictive properties. In acute panic attacks, reassurance is the first line, focusing on slowing breathing and ensuring the person understands that they are safe. But in severe cases, benzodiazepines are used. 